This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. Francis quietly gave a document to synod participants that is essentially an oath to modernism. The document was a historic document signed by several influential bishops in the final days of the Second Vatican Council and it secretly pledged the signers to turning the church into an organization for liberation theology. That document, the Pact of the Catacombs, has had a catastrophic effect on the church in the past 60 years. And now Francis has given copies to the participants at the Synod of Sin. LifeSite News gives us this story here. Headline, Pope Francis gives Synod members Vatican II lobby groups liberation theology text. Church historian Roberto de Mattei told LifeSite News that this hugely significant event is the, quote, last act of a process, beginning with Vatican II and culminating in Pope Francis's synod on it, synodality. The modernists are really committed to the revolution in their church. The document Francis gave to synod members was the infamous Pact of the Catacombs. The English translation of the Pact of the Catacombs comes with this preface for some context. Quote, As Vatican Council II drew to a close in 1965, 40 bishops met at night in the Domitia Catacombs outside of Rome. In that holy place of Christian dead, they celebrated the Eucharist and signed a document that expressed their personal commitments as bishops to the ideals of the Council under the suggestive title of the Pact of the Catacombs. The only place we have found its complete text transcribed is in the Chronicle of Vatican II by the Franciscan bishop Boaventura Kloppenberg. He titled the document Pact of the Servant and Poor Church. It is known that the bishops were led by Archbishop Helder Camara of Rasil, Brazil, one of the widely respected 20th century champions of justice and peace. Later on, Cardinal Roger Echigadigade, who served as Honorable President of the Pontifical Council, Justice and Peace, also signed it. End quote. So some of the contents of the Pact of the Catacombs are actually not terrible. Among other things, the signers pledged to basically not become celebrity bishops and priests, which today might be a bit refreshing, to be honest. But even most of the better items, when taken as a whole, in the context of the full document, reveals that the document is meant to bring the bishops and priests of the church down to the level of the laity and to elevate the laity in the church, more so than Vatican II called for. It is a democratizing document, signed in secret in 1965 at the close of the Council in the catacomb tombs of the Christian martyrs in Rome. So here's how LifeSite describes all of this. Quote, in a hugely significant move, participants of the Synod on Synodality were quietly given the text of a secretive pact, first composed by a group of liberal theologians during Vatican II which is part of a relativistic and egalitarian plan embodied and enacted by Pope Francis to, quote, change the identity of the Catholic Church. In an article published October 13th, Jesuit-run America magazine revealed that participants of the Synod on Synodality were given a controversial and secret text during their October 12th trip to the catacombs of Saints Sebastian, Callistus, and Domitia. An archive of the America magazine report is available, and I'll have a link to it in my show notes. The report stated how the prayer booklet given to synod participants included the full text of the Pact of the Catacombs. Of note is that this was not included in the booklet email to journalists of the Vatican Press Corps. <laughs> End quote. It's noteworthy that the Vatican casually decided to not let the journalists know about the Pact of the Catacombs being distributed to the synod participants. This may be one of the main reasons synod participants were made to swear an oath under the pontifical secret to not divulge the happenings of the synod to the media. The Pact of the Catacombs is infamous because it swore to change the Catholic Church fundamentally. Moving away from something divine and hierarchical to a social agency. Dr. Roberto de Mattei described it in that way when he told LifeSite News the following, quote, the Catacombs Pact, distributed to the Synod Fathers last week, is not a purely commemorative event, but the last act of a process that began with the Second Vatican Council and has its ultimate expression in the Synodal Project, encouraged by Pope Francis to change the identity of the Catholic Church, removing any Constantinian element and transforming it into an egalitarian and pauperist social agency. 
end quote. Now, I have the full text of the Pact of the Catacombs here for you, which I'll get to here in a moment. It's worth noting that the document explicitly calls for the Church to help alleviate social conditions in purely materialistic terms. Spreading the gospel is barely mentioned at all. Rather, Christ is by implication invoked as essentially a liberator. The document was the Pledge of Liberation Theology for the handful of clerics who initially signed it in the 1960s. It's also worth noting that a new Pact of the Catacombs was signed after the Pan-Amazon Synod in late 2019, the same synod with the Epac Amama Idol, which was a doubling down on the call for the Church to participate in the efforts of the rulers of the world to create a more just and green world. And with all that in mind, here's the full text of the Pact of the Catacombs. We, the bishops assembled in the Second Vatican Council, are conscious of the deficiencies of our lifestyle in terms of evangelical poverty, motivated by one another in an initiative in which each of us has tried to avoid ambition and presumption. We unite with all our brothers in the episcopacy and rely above all on the grace and strength of our Lord Jesus Christ and on the prayer of the faithful and the priests in our respective dioceses. Placing ourselves in thought and in prayer before the Trinity, the Church of Christ, and all the priests and faithful of our dioceses, with humility and awareness of our weakness, but also and with all the determination and all the strength that God desires to grant us by His grace, we commit ourselves to the following. We will try to live according to the ordinary manner of our people in all that concerns housing, food, means of transportation, and related matters. We renounce forever the appearance and substance of wealth, especially in clothing, rich vestments, loud colors, and symbols made of precious metals. These signs should certainly be evangelical, neither silver nor gold. We will not possess in our own names any properties or other goods, nor will we have bank accounts or the like. If it is necessary to possess something, we will place everything in the name of the diocese or of social or charitable works. As far as possible, we will entrust the financial and material running of our diocese to a commission of competent laypersons who are aware of their apostolic role so that we can be less administrators and more pastors and apostles. We do not wish to be addressed verbally or in writing with names and titles that express prominence and power, such as eminence, excellency, lordship. We prefer to be called by the evangelical name of Father. In our communications and social relations, we will avoid everything that may appear as a concession of privilege, prominence, or even preference to the wealthy and the powerful, for example, in religious services or by way of banquet invitations offered or accepted. Likewise, we will avoid favoring or fostering the vanity of anyone at the moment of seeking or acknowledging aid or for any other reason. We will invite our faithful to consider their donations as a normal way of participating in worship in the apostolate, and in social action. We will give whatever is needed in terms of our time, our reflection, our heart, our means, etc., to the apostolic and pastoral service of workers and labor groups, and to those who are economically weak and disadvantaged, without allowing that to detract from the welfare of other persons or groups of the diocese. We will support lay people, religious, deacons, and priests, whom the Lord calls to evangelize the poor, and the workers by sharing their lives and their labors. Conscious of the requirements of justice and charity, and of their mutual relatedness, we will seek to transform our works of welfare into social works based on charity and justice, so that they take all persons into account as a humble service to the responsible public agencies. We will do everything possible so that those responsible for our governments and our public services establish and enforce the laws, social structures, and institutions that are necessary for justice, equality, and the integral, harmonious development of the whole person, and of all persons, and thus for the advent of a new social order, worthy of the children of God. Since the collegiality of the bishops finds its supreme evangelical realization in jointly serving the two-thirds of humanity who live in physical, cultural, and moral misery, we commit ourselves, a, to support as far as possible the most urgent projects of the episcopacies of the poor nations, and b, to request jointly 
at the level of international organisms the adoption of economic and cultural structures, which, instead of producing poor nations in an ever-richer world, make it possible for the poor majorities to free themselves from their wretchedness. We will do this, all this even as we bear witness to the gospel, after the example of Pope Paul VI at the United Nations. We commit ourselves to sharing our lives in pastoral charity with our brothers and sisters in Christ, priests, religious, and laity, so that our ministry constitutes a true service. Accordingly, we will make an effort to review our lives with them. We will seek collaborators in ministry so that we can make animators according to the spirit rather than dominators according to the world. We will try to make ourselves as humanly present and welcoming as possible, and we will show ourselves to be open to all, no matter what their beliefs. When we return to our dioceses, we will make these resolutions known to our diocesan priests and ask them to assist us with their comprehension, their collaboration, and their prayers. May God help us to be faithful. With all that in mind, the LifeSite article includes a link to the American Magazine report on this happening, and here's how they characterize everything you just heard. Quote, the bishops, largely Latin American, were inspired and challenged by the Council's discussions on poverty and stirred by the realization that they were not living the poverty that they believed the gospel called them to. A few of the documents' 13 points include living a lifestyle that is materially similar to their parishioners, meaning living in an ordinary house, not giving out, going out for expensive meals, and taking public transit, not being called by prestigious titles, not holding bank accounts or real estate in their own names, and trusting financial administration of their dioceses to lay people, advocating civil and international policies that would permit the poor masses to overcome their misery. That's a good one there. Being open to all people, regardless of religion. The document ended up being signed by some 500 bishops in the following months, and it went on to inspire Latin American liberation theology which led to the social justice advocacy and martyrdom of Catholic bishops, priests, and religious and lay people like Saints Oscar Romero, Rutio Grande, and the Church Women of El Salvador, to name just a few. It was this church that Pope Francis was raised and ministered in, one in which the bishops chose material poverty and ecclesiastical humility, led to synodal groups like Christian-based communities, scripture study circles that happened in people's homes, which were most which is where most participants first time reading and interpreting the Bible, all the way up to the Pan-Amazonian Ecclesial Network, REPM. End quote. That last group was part of the Pan-Amazon Synod, key to it, in fact. Now, most of the results of the Pact of the Catacombs have been actually a disaster for the Church, starting at the most basic level with bishops not respecting their own offices, and laity treating bishops less like apostles and more like their neighbors or friends. This has, of course, trickled down to a general disregard for the priesthood as well, and this destruction of respect for the hierarchy has had social effects, of course. Lay administration of parishes has been terrible for the Church, which has allowed heirs to take a foothold in parishes run by typically retired women who often have more real authority in the parish than the parish priest does. If you've ever wondered why your parish can't adopt needed change despite your priest telling you he supports them, that's one reason. In these structures, the lay running of parishes didn't exist before Vatican II for the most part. But at the core of this is the annihilation of the difference between the laity and the ordained that is clearly evident in the Gospels. There is a difference between the apostles and the disciples. There just are. And the pact seeks to destroy that difference. The authority of the bishops is reduced to basically being managerial figures who sometimes get on TV and spout vaguely Catholic-sounding platitudes endorsing whatever secular program is going on at the moment, usually going one way on the political spectrum, by the way. That pact managed to dress that program up in language that sounded fairly decent but was sprinkled throughout with the language of Marx and his heirs. Now... What should we think of this? Is Francis sending a signal to the bishops and laity participating in the synod that the point of the synod is to finish the work of making the church into the vision of the church as presented in the Pact of the Catacombs? Will this be more of a divorce from the gospel that we're already familiar with? Should we expect more secularization of the church? And remember, the changes in the church are meant to be irreversible, as we've seen with the Pact of the Catacombs which we can think of as a sort of oath 
to modernism, regardless of the relative conservatism of, of any pope, the bishops, priests, and influential laity are all sworn to that document. In fact, even a conservative pope in the future may have actually signed it himself, because that could happen. And the bishops are sworn to uphold it, regardless of what any future pope might say. What do you think the effect of that's going to be? Let me know what you think of all this in the comments, please. And hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So to share this on social media, that helps too. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.